It's, uh, it's really an honor to be here, uh, you know, with Aaron, one of the all-time great quarterbacks in college football. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, so many uh, accolades have uh, come his way through his great performance at Georgia. And uh, let me just say, uh, as a member of the Georgia Quarterback Club, enjoyed every single moment watching uh, Aaron throw that ball around and play the game. So it's always a pleasure to be uh, hanging out with you, just, Aaron. Just wish I had one of those rings in my hand, you know. <laughs> I'll trade you one of the records for the ring. Yeah. Uh, you know, Cellini was giving me a hard time about wearing it today, but I don't normally wear it. But, hey, when you're hanging out with a Georgia legend, right, <laughs> you you got to bust it out, otherwise it I'd out. never get a chance to wear it. But These days they give out these rings. Uh, you've seen them, Aaron, where they're just too big to even wear. I mean, you can barely see what I've got on here. Thank goodness for Herschel, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Aaron, I think the thing that we'll get started with this, the thing that I really uh, respect probably more than any of those records and all those victories that you had was, was you started 52 consecutive games. Yep. Uh, Talk about tough. Yeah, and I got my butt whooped too. <laughs> these these quarterbacks nowadays are soft. They get they get tapped and they go to the ground and it's a penalty. So I was actually doing a show yesterday. Uh, it was actually they brought me on the golf channel on Sirius XM and, and they were YouTubing because these golfers they're so fascinated by you know guys getting tackled because they've never been able to get tackled before. But they were like YouTubing some of the hits I took during my career and they're like, oh my god, we're watching. 2010 versus Auburn. Oh my God, we just saw you get demolished versus Alabama in the 2012 SEC Championship game. I'm like, yeah, like that's what it was like back then. I don't even want to imagine what you got hit like back in, in, oh, in the 80s. Oh, I just handed it off. Oh, you I handed it off. So, like, so as you guys can tell, like, I'm not like, I'm not that big. You know, I, unfortunately, my dad's 6'3, my brother's 6'2. Uh, the person in the family that needed the height the most did not get it. Uh, you know, well, I thought you were six three, but after you got hit so many times, yes, it's that's now what it was. Six, that's one. what it was. I got knocked down, yeah. so uh, I took my fair share of licks for those four years. But as I was telling those guys back there when when we were on on the air, it was you know, I, you literally had to carry me off the field, and and I've always had the mentality, which is probably not smart. You know, this this goes back to high school. I broke my leg my senior year, literally got snapped in half. One of those moments where the guy horse collars you, pulls you down, my leg snapped. I'm laying on my stomach. I look back. My foot's pointing up the other direction. And it's actually quite hilarious because they're videoing the entire thing. And you see the surgeon walk on the field or team doctor, whatever it was, grabs my foot, snaps it back into place. So it was a broken tibia, fractured ankle or um, dislocated ankle, excuse me. And I remember looking at him. I said, okay, I'm ready to go back in. And he's like, he clicks it. He goes, no, 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 your leg's broken. You're oh. done. And I was like, well, I'm not going to be done for long. Six weeks later, essentially in a boot, I played in a state semifinal football game, won that, won a state championship the next week. And then I remember, you know, like Auburn, you know, I third possession of the game, it was our 144 Angel. So post route, clear out by the tight end, and then A.J. Green was running like a deep, deep dig route. Hit AJ, Nick Fairley picks me up, lifts me, puts me into the ground, and I felt like my entire left side just kind of cave in. And, you know, the entire game, I was numb from the left side over. So it ended up being doing x rays after the game. They did x ray on my chest. Uh, I fractured my sternum. So that game, fractured sternum, 10 stitches in my chin, sprained knee, had to sleep sitting up with a neck brace on for two weeks because I couldn't lay down because my chest felt like it was going to rip open. Um, so, like, I've always been one that just is really stupid. I say this all to say, like, I'm an idiot because I should not have played. Um, but I was one that, like, I literally would not come off the field uh, unless you had to carry me off the field. Um, so it was great, though. It, it, it hurts my golf game now a little bit, though. Well, I'd say a rule number one as a starting quarterback, you never let the second team quarterback get on the field. <laughs> Auburn snapped my leg like a dry twig. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, yeah, you know, all those records that, that Aaron broke uh, during his tenure there at Georgia were Danny Warfels, all right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, Danny Warfel, one of the all-time great quarterbacks out there, too. And I know that, uh, that makes it even more meaningful, right? Oh, when you're yeah, breaking a guy like Florida. that's record? Oh, yeah. Well, a guy like that, yeah. uh, a guy that played at Florida always helps, too. Uh, and, and I was a little nervous, though, that a, a quarterback from Mississippi State was going to break all my records, though, because of the air raid offense and... 
<laughs> those guys, you know, you, we get inside the five yard line. I'm going to hand the ball off to Todd Gurley. You know, they're, they're, we're giving it to Todd three times. They get inside the five yard line. They're going to throw it four times and go for it on fourth down and, and find a way to get a touchdown. But no, I loved him. I actually had an opportunity to cover him a few times, but uh, was extremely happy that he transferred to Washington and, uh, and is out of the SEC now. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's special to have those records. You have to play four years. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it, it is, it is something that um, I don't think most of these guys nowadays, you know, are gonna play four years. And so I feel pretty good, you know, at least for the next five years, based on what I'm seeing right now in the SEC, that uh, that I may be secure for a little bit. Hey, let's talk about the big win last Saturday night, uh, taking down number one Texas. Uh, does it get any better than that? And yeah, I saw Sarkeesian on game day uh, Saturday morning. And he was uh, – they had him on the, uh, the board, and he was showing off what it, the motion on offense and the great play calls and game plan that he had uh, ready to unleash on that Georgia defense. That didn't work out very well. No, and it didn't. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to play quarterback uh, when you're on your back. So, I, finally, the defense played like we thought they would. You know, Jalen's been great the entire season. You know, it was good to see Mike Hell finally get going a little bit on the outside. A guy that, that stood out to me that a lot of guys aren't talking about. I mean, everyone's talking about Jalen and Michael and, you know, talking about Everett and the big game he had, the interception, the, the, the sack fumble off the edge, which was an incredible blitz. But if you go back and watch the tape and watch Malachi Starks, we, 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 we take for granted just how good he is. Number 24 in that game was playing strong safety. He was playing free, uh, free safety. He was playing single height safety in the middle of the field. He was rotating him to the linebacker depth, playing that position. And then on top of all that, he was playing nickel. So essentially he became the third defensive back, true cornerback, playing man-to-man -man with a slot receiver. And as you allude to, this is not just a basic defense or offense in Texas that was just line up and play. There's shifts, there's motions, there's moving receivers in different spots. And Malachi showed to me that he could play, obviously, safety. He could play nickel. He can play man-to-man -man coverage against these elite receivers. I, number 24 is one of the best defensive players I've seen in a long time. I mean, it was unbelievable to watch him go out there and have that magnificent of a football game. So, overall, just really impressed with the defense. Now it's like, can you do that every week? In years past, Georgia did that every week. So we were, we're used to seeing that. Yeah. It's sad that, like, and not sad again, like, it's, 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 it's a huge victory over a great offense, no doubt about it. But, like, they are capable of doing it every week. Now I need to see them go out there and do that. Yeah, you play defense like that, you got a chance to win a championship mm -hmm. is, you know, the impression they left on me there. Uh, I think some of it was health. Uh, Brentson yep. back at defensive tackle mm -hmm. really helped him stuff the good. run. They, we've really missed him. Uh, Michael has been, uh, you know, sort of a shell of the yeah. the player that he's capable of being, and he showed up big. And how about Jalen Walker mm. coming mm. off the edge? He's been man. that all year, though. Yeah. I mean, if you want to say, like, who's the MVP of this football team to the first part of the season before the Florida game, it'd probably be Jalen. I mean, Jalen, every single game, going back to Clemson, has been a game wrecker up front. And I notice after the game, he's, he's the team's spokesperson. Yeah. Uh, presenting – Coach uh, Smart with uh, game football for his 100th win as a head coach. It was Jalen Walker doing yeah. the talking. Well, Carson's not. Carson's no, little, no, well, he's Carson's a little quiet, quiet. Carson's yeah. a little quiet. Yeah, so uh, that's not they tried to Carson. rob us, by the way. <laughs> uh, you know, Kirby said it in that post-game interview. What would you make of that? It looked like they were trying to pull one over on us. I, so, so I do a, um, a show every Sunday night. It's me – it's no Sean, it's Tavares, it's Ben Jones. So and then we'll get like Pollock will come on. We'll get some defensive guys. Pollock, Boykin will come on. Champ will come on. But we were, um, we were talking on Sunday night about that, and I thought no Sean made a really good point that I at that point had not thought about. No Sean's like, I'm happy they reversed the call for how crazy and stupid it is and unprecedented it is and it should never have happened. But Texas fans being Texas fans, and this is every fan base, Georgia would have been bitching about if it happened against them too. Um, I would have been bitching about it happening against us. But the fact that Texas could not use that as an excuse as to why they lost the game 
is actually I'm happy that they went reversed it because if Georgia would have won the football game and, and won the football game like they did, Texas fans would have been like, oh, well, we would have had a, the football inside the 10-yard line, had a chance to score and make it a one-score game and blah, blah, blah. blah. We, we, should, we would have come back and win. Like, no, you did get it. You did score. And guess what? Georgia went back and scored and, and, and essentially closed the deal up 30 to 15. So uh, I'm glad it did change, but it was um, – it's a shame that Texas fans stoop that low, yeah. one, and then two, that the refs, you know, use that extra time to go and make the change. Well, there were some questionable calls in the game, and that was just one of them. I yep. thought the two targeting calls were yep. were questionable. Especially uh, the one against uh, Aguero. A couple of spots on ETN were one. It was clear he scored the touchdown. He yep. extended the ball. His knee was not down. They spotted it at the one-yard line even after reviewing it. And then we tried to ice the game at the end. It's third down and nine. We give it to ETN. Looks like he picks up the first down on the sideline. And then they mark the ball short of the first down. And then the uh, the press box to sideline communication went out just for Georgia. Yeah. Now Texas is still was working. And say so I see Bobo up there with a walkie-talkie that looked like I had back when I was six years old yep. out in the backyard. Uh, clearly something going on. And it's, they, it's, it's good for college football if Texas is good. So, yeah. you know, they like that All brand. Right. They like them going, you know, one of the blue blood. So Head referee. From Son Texas. went to Texas. Yeah. He's got a business in Dallas. I mean, what's going on? How do they be, allow him to referee that game? Listen – to overcome all of that and, and win and win on the road, and like Kirby said after the game, the fact that everyone doubted them heading into it, um, you know, and with how bad they played on offense, you know, I'm sure we're going to get to that. But, I mean, it, it still has not been one game this season that I can sit back and say Georgia's played a complete game, and, and they haven't done that, and they're the number two team in the country. They just beat Texas on the road by double digits. They had the incredible comeback against Alabama, and they have yet to really put it all together, which I guess is frustrating for one one aspect of it, but then also should be encouraging. Like if they do finally get it all together, which hopefully this bye week lets them kind of regroup and figure out who their identity is on offense. I, I don't think there's a team out there as of right now that could beat them. Yeah, let's talk about your broadcasting career as we uh, settle in. We'll get to Carson Beck in a minute. <laughs> Uh, you're, you're working some uh, Sirius XM radio, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, I enjoy hearing you on that. And, you know, as we mentioned, color analyst work uh, covering the SEC. Uh, and you've got a young family. I know. And you're leaving God, God, on the God, weekends. God, God bless my wife. Yeah, she must be something special. There, there's no worse feeling. So before every one of my games, I like to, you know, FaceTime, especially if it's a night game. So, like, last week I had Florida, Kentucky. So it was like 7.15. I was like, I'm going to FaceTime the kiddos to say, like, good night. Like, good night. You know, be good for your mom, yada, yada. And there's no worse <laughs> feeling like my wife picking up the FaceTime and looking at me. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Bye. Hurry home. Tell the kids I said I love them. Good night. <laughs> I was like, thank you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> she said Maddox is being an asshole. I was like, oh, uh. damn it, Maddox. <laughs> Why are you being an asshole? No, my, our kids are great. 95% of the time, as everyone who has kids here knows. Uh, they're four and two. Uh, the struggle at times is when they're in the same room together. Um, my daughter, actually, which I love it. She's, a, she's so tenacious. She will beat the living shit out of my son. I mean, <laughs> she just beats him up. He's going to be tough, too. He will, I don't have to toughen him up because yeah. she does it for me. He'll be just sitting there watching, you know, some show, and she'll just come over there and just punch him. I'm like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> but... Uh, it's, it's good for him. They, they're, they're great. And my wife's tremendous, um, really blessed, but I love what I do, man. Get, especially this year, get to cover the SEC primarily. Now your wife, she's a George. She went to Georgia too, right? And, went to and Georgia. Do I have the story right? You met, uh, walking dogs. We met at a dog park. A dog Close park. Yes. Okay. I mean, at a dog park. She, my wife, um, so she's an attorney for Insight Global, in-house counsel for them. And she does not like football. Never didn't really go to football games at Georgia. We had sit, we had mutual friends, but never knew each other. And I mean, I had no idea who I was when we met at the dog park. I had no idea. This is when I was still playing in the NFL. I had Isn't no that idea. Awesome. Oh, it was tremendous. Yeah. Uh, I remember when when we went on our first date. We you know got an Uber, and we get out of the Uber, and the Uber driver's like, "Oh, can you take a picture of me and Aaron?" And she's like, 
what? Like, why does the Uber driver want me to take a picture <laughs> of you and him? And I was like, ah, I played football for Georgia, and I think he's probably a Georgia fan. So I think that she was like, what the hell am I getting That's into? That's priceless. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised she didn't walk out after that. So, uh, but no, she's um, yeah, slowly getting into football. Yeah. I actually just had, you know, you, you, your, your phone gives you memories, photos. Some, for some reason, Tay, memories from the Rose Bowl back in, what was that, 17? Yeah, something like that. 17, 18, popped up. And I remember that's the first time we both got really drunk at the game. And she got really emotional afterwards. Like, I mean, it was like all, I think everyone in. in, in about Georgia winning? Yeah, about Georgia winning. I mean, it okay. was a, I think the being in that stadium, which is just iconic, the way in which Georgia came back, the drinks were flowing. I remember like both of us were like, started like crying afterwards, like celebrate. I'm like, I'm like, I know why I'm getting emotional, but you don't even like football. Like, why are you getting emotional? She was, I don't know. Like, she's just, coming around. Yeah, she's coming around yeah. to it. So, um, she she enjoys it some. Uh, now it's the the discussion is going to be in the next few years of like, do we let our son play football? So we'll uh, we'll, we'll cross that path when we get there. All right. So you uh, you're in Tampa playing high school football at Plant High School. I heard you mm -hmm. talking about this on 680 a few minutes ago with Cellini and Domino, and really enjoyed the story. So you uh, you grew up a, an NFL guy. Yep. In Tampa. The Dungies have anything to do with that? Dungies. Well, I played with Dungy's son. Yeah. Uh, Eric was one of my receivers. So, um, but obviously love yeah. Dungy, love Gruden. Um, you know, won a Super Bowl. I was down there. But yeah, I mean, Tampa's not really a college town. My family doesn't. You know, parents don't come from college towns. My dad grew up in Syracuse, New York. Um, you know, not big in football. My mom grew up in in Miami, which is still more pro than it is than college. So, like, I never had a college team growing up that I like loved and supported and rooted for. I was just like, you know, Saturdays for me was, you know, playing football, playing baseball, playing basketball. You know, Sunday was NFL day. We, like, we had, you know, we had season tickets to go watch the Bucks. We had season tickets to go watch the, uh, the Bolts. You know, we went to a lot of hockey games. You know, every now and then we'd go to Rays games where they weren't that great with growing up. Um, but yeah, like I, my first, like my first time watching a Georgia football game was 2007 Sugar Bowl. Like recruiting visit? No, no, it was the uh, you the watch it on TV. Yeah, and I was rooting for Hawaii because I knew Colt, Colt Brennan. Brennan. I knew Colt Brennan. Yeah. Um, and then Georgia comes out with the black uniforms and kicks her ass. I was like, okay, <laughs> kind of like that. that yeah, I heard good. New, new Heisel now at CBS was trying to recruit you to come to UCLA. Yeah, how was he selling LA to you? How was he not? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you, first of all, he picks me up in his Beamer at the airport. Yeah, takes me to the Rose Bowl. Takes me to the 50 yard line of the Rose Bowl. It's just me, New Heisel, my dad. And you're just looking around like, oh my God, like I could play football here. Then for those who have been to UCLA's campus, it's probably the most beautiful campus, one of the most beautiful campuses in America. I mean, right in Beverly Hills, you got gorgeous girls, you got great weather, you got Beverly Hills. Sounded like, good, huh? It sounded yeah. good. And New Heisel is a hell of a, a, a sal you know, salesman. So um, very close to committing. Glad I didn't. And, um, you know, from there, I was like, all right, I, I want to go SEC. I want to be close to home. And I remember going into a, a, a quarterback meeting at Florida because I was really close with Dan Mullen. And in the meeting was Tim, Cam Newen, and John Brantley. And I was like, I don't know if I really fit in this quarterback room. These guys are, you know, Tim is 240. Cam is the biggest human being I've ever seen. Cam's calves are the size of my thigh. Yeah. And I was like, and then Brantley was one of the top recruits the year before me. So I was like, it just was a really deep quarterback room. Uh, and then obviously the rumors was Dan was going to leave and go take a head coaching job. And I didn't really get along with Urban too well. Um, and I love Rick. I love Bobo. Obviously love the fact that, that Stafford was going to be on his way out and there wasn't a lot of depth at Georgia. Um, so, yeah. Step in and play immediately, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, as far as Bobo goes, all right, so I know Mark Richt. Uh, I'm surprised we didn't get any, boo any, been, any booing when you heard the word Bobo in the room. That must have been, uh, you know, something to look forward to as far as Mark Rick being the head coach. Mm -hmm. But Bobo's recruiting you, Yep. all right? And, and I just, uh, I will never understand the criticism with Mike. A, uh, he's a member of our Georgia Bulldog quarterback club and, been a lifelong Georgia guy and does a great job game planning and play calling. And yet, these fans just kill Mike Bobo. <laughs> K 
Can you give us an explanation as to why? I think it's because he's been here for so long. I think that, that there's that familiarity where you know someone, so you feel like you can get after him a little bit too, maybe a little bit more. I mean, from obviously played here, was an analyst, then quarterback coach, then, then offense coordinator, and then now back as an OC. So I think people just have, have seen, been around Bobo for, God, over 30 years now. So there's that, you know, when you know someone, you can feel like you can kind of give it to them a little bit more. That's what I, at least I say that's the problem. But, um, I mean, people would get after Bobo when I was at Georgia, and we were the number two offense in the SEC, scoring over 40 points per game. Yeah. And I'm just, like, laughing, just like, we are literally the number two offense in the country. Why does anyone get after Grantham? Because we're giving up a shitload of points. Like, get up the D.C. <laughs> like, come on. It ain't, it's not the offense's fault that we're losing games right now. Yeah. We're scoring points. But, um, uh, hey, listen, it, it comes with the territory. I think Everybody's Bo- a play that, caller. Yeah, everyone's yeah, a play man. caller. Everyone's a quarterback. I mean, hell, after games in which I did struggled, um, you know, maybe threw a pick or two or three. I don't remember those. There was definitely a few. My biggest critic was my sister. You know, like, mom would come up, give me a hug. Dad would be like, you know, cheer up, you'll be fine. Like, I'd be devastated. Like, I wanted to go. You know, I was one, if I threw, if I had a bad game, like, I was in the film room that night. Your didn't sister want to see said anyone. you were terrible today. Yeah, my sister would be like, <laughs> did you not see the linebacker? Did you not see the safety? What are you doing? I'm like, I don't need this from you right now. Like, why aren't you hugging me, telling me how much you love me? Um, so, like, she was, she, she got after me. Like, she was the worst of anyone. So... Uh, it just it, it, it comes with the territory. I get it. I'm just glad I I didn't live in an era where social media is as prevalent as now. Um, I would hope I would do what Stetson did and just get a flip phone. That way I don't have to worry about yeah. checking TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and all that craziness. You know, you hear some of these players and they talk about the grind and, you know, uh, practice every week. And, and, you know, I can remember just looking forward to practice. But I got a chance to go out and throw it to Lindsey Scott. Yeah during practice, uh, Amp Arnold. And so I wanted to uh, – you had an on, the honor of playing with some really great wide receivers. And, and so I wanted to bring their names up, and I know you love bragging on them. And just give us a little thumbnail sketch of yep. each guy. All right, let's start with A.J. Green. Uh, I don't know if there's much to say other than everyone knows. I mean, one of the greatest receivers in Georgia history. The thing that was, was crazy about A.J., because A.J. is not, like, thick. You know, AJ's string beanish, I guess you could say, six four, but man, AJ was country strong, like in long arms. Like I mean, could probably go from to your opposite shoulder if he reached from where I am right now. I mean, I remember one game against Vanderbilt, and this was Vanderbilt was actually pretty good. Um, I threw a, it was like R, so I formation to the right, R forty three lead backside Z pop. So if there was free access to AJ, I could just like fake like I was, it was like the old school I formation RPO, like before yeah, RPOs that. got crazy. Yeah. yeah. So the guy's off AJ. So I just throw, you know, I throw it out to him and it's one on one. There's no lead blocker. It's AJ. You had 10 yards of separation. You catch it and make a guy miss. And I remember he like grabbed the dude by the face and just shoved him to the ground and, and then ran 70 yards for a touchdown. I'm like, oh my God, like this is unbelievable. So like his, <laughs> his strength. His flexibility, I mean, we all remember the high school catch where he, psh, I mean, the Colorado catch where he went up one hand. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable. So, yeah, just stronger than, than I thought he would be, like, looking at him. Tough to overthrow him. Yeah, very yeah. tough to overthrow. All right, Tavares King. Blazing speed. Blazing speed. I mean, Joe, Car- Tavares and I joke all the time that, you know, Carson and these receivers need to go watch how to throw back shoulder fades and, and post routes and just go watch 2011 and 12. Because that's all we did. I mean, it was play action, post route, play action, back shoulder fade. I mean, we were airing it out over and over and over again. So, you know, Tavares, unbelievable ability to step on the toes of a, of a, of a DB, give a little wiggle, and then use that 4-3 speed and go over the top. He was a really cool guy, too. Yes. I mean, yeah. super. Tavares was one. Tavares would drink all night. To about two o'clock in the morning. What was he drinking? Lots of lots of liquor. Old granddad. Yeah, Tavares TK would drink till about two o'clock. Go out to the bars, go sleep at the Butts Mirror for about three hours. So he'd get there about two two thirty. Go to his locker, take a nap. We'd have five o'clock workouts. So like I would go to bed at eight or nine, do some stretching, eat really well. 
wake up early, eat a nice breakfast, go to 6 a.m. run, and Tavares, who is still drunk, would whoop all of our asses still. I mean, would lap us. Like, we would run like two miles. Oh, he was somehow, he's just, him and and Gurley were the same. Like, Gurley would party all night, still show up the next morning and squat 600 pounds like it was nothing. Like, some guys could just do it. We're just going to keep this in house if we can. Yeah, we won't share this. This was all, no, this was off season. This was off season. This yeah. was not in season. Yeah, you know, exactly. we got we have we got to have some fun, okay? Right, we are yeah. football players, we have some fun. But like there are certain guys that could burn in on both ends. I was not one of them. Um, but those dudes, it was impressive like what they could do. Marlon Brown. Wish I had more time with Marlon. Um, unfortunately, Marlon was banged up for a lot of his career, but like he was about 6-5, wasn't he? I know. Another big big he was strong now. Like AJ was wiry Marlon was built very broad, strong, um, not the same flexibility as AJ, but man, was he, when he caught the football, he was tough to bring down. Chris Durham. Ooh, my first touchdown pass oh, what was, was to it? Chris Durham. What was the play? Back shoulder fade. All right. Yeah, that's when the back shoulder fade uh, got me all, all yeah. hot and bothered. You were good um, at that. That was my favorite throw. Well, I thought the dig was. That was to Michael Bennett. Okay. Michael and I had a great connection on the dig routes. Anytime we had this. He's in commercial real estate yeah, here in Atlanta yeah, now. He's kicking butt. We'd have this play called, you know, Rex Gun or Lou Gun, 62, 63 Verizon. So we'd have a front side deep out versus free access. You could rip it. And then versus any kind of shell cover two, you would work a, a dig route with a sit down and you just read that backside linebacker. So. You know, a lot of times in two-minute drives, teams want to play cover two, you know, because they just want to keep everything in front. So you would move the middle linebacker to the right, and you'd come back and work that wheel linebacker with a high-low with a tight end sit and then a dig route. And Michael caught a bajillion passes on that. Di- any like any two-minute drive, it was like, all right, Michael, dig route, dig route, dig route, dig route. And, and just so reliable over the middle of the field. Good size, too. I mean, he's 6'3". Yeah. He was about 2'10". Could take a punishment over the middle. All right, my man from Valdosta, Malcolm Mitchell. Woo! Another one, too, like senior year. Well, he came up to Georgia. He, he could play cornerback or receiver. I think they wanted him at cornerback yeah. initially. Um, one of the best people you ever know, too. I mean, his foundation. So for those who don't know, Malcolm uh, does an incredible job. He's written, I think, three children's books now. Yeah. Um, does a lot of work with, with kids and making sure that they're – Able to read at a young age and, and, and underprivileged areas. He's smart the state. too. He's very smart. Uh, co-written these with the governor's wife. Yes, yeah. so uh, really great smart. Um, heck of a receiver. Wish he didn't tear his ACL first game versus Clemson senior year. Chris Conley. He's still playing in the NFL. Still playing. Yeah. Uh, San Fran, I believe. Speed. Can't teach speed, man. Yeah. Fastest receiver I ever played with. All right. You talked about Michael Bennett. And you also talked about, you know, I had a chance to, uh, you know, some games that really stand out to me about your uh, career. And, uh, you know, my family was involved in several of them. Like the, uh, I'll bring up the first one. So my wife is you a went U- way back. My wife's a UCF grad. She's oh. from Orlando. And so you guys, you're, you're redshirt freshman year, right? Mm-hmm. You redshirt. So your first year as a starter you go to Memphis for the Liberty Bowl to play Woo! UCF. And my wife says, why don't we get tickets? We take the kids, so we load up our three young children, go to Memphis for the game. And, Aaron, you guys really let me down. I heard, <laughs> I heard about UCF. I'm still hearing about UCF yeah. winning that game. Oh, I, I hear about it. I had a couple of UCF games early in my broadcasting career, and I heard it from fans that wanted to bring up that 2010 football game, too. Um, well, we kicked uh, like two field goals. It was ugly. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. And then, well, it finally, wasn't your fault. No, no, it was a lot of my fault. I'm not going to lie. I mean, I Bobo awful. was terrible. Yeah, that Bobo day. did cause a bad place. <laughs> then finally, we're actually down. What, what was the final score? Like seven to six? Yeah, it's like nine to six. Yeah, or whatever. Nine to seven. We had this play. Ten end, to six. End of the game. They come out, like I said, two minute drives. Teams like to play cover two. And Chris Durham had a corner post from the slot. And it actually got wide open, but just before the play, two plays before that, it started to rain. And my hands, I don't got big hands, I cannot throw in the rain. And he got so wide open, he spun the safety around. And the ball slipped out of my hands and just fluttered in the air. And I'm like, oh my God, for how bad we played, if it didn't start raining two plays before, we would have actually somehow found a way to win that football game. 
but my baby hands could not handle the football at that moment, and it just slipped, and oh, that was a bad game. Yeah, that ride back to Atlanta seemed like it went on for about 14 hours. Yeah, that was a rough one. Yeah. That was a rough one. Good grief. Oh. And then uh, the Capital One Bowl game against Nebraska. You guys won that one. Yes. Scored 45 points. You had a heck of a day. And uh, we had the family at that one. Again, mm -hmm. my wife from Orlando, the kids were older now. They knew what was going on. You and Conley put on a show that day. Conley, TK had a nice post route for a touchdown. Uh, that was also when Keith Marshall had the wheel route back shoulder that I threw to him that he made an incredible catch in the end zone as well. You had five touchdowns that game. Yeah. Chris had the one. It was a um, – this would have happened versus Alabama. So for the one that – the first, I think it was the first pick uh, to 11, it was supposed to be a tunnel screen versus cover zero to Arian. And Arian goes and blocks and Carson throws the pick. That was the same play we ran to the slot to Chris Conley versus Nebraska. It was third down. They were bringing an all-out blitz. We checked to the, the tunnel screen, and you, know, you just got to find a window. You find a window, there's no one left. He's still running. Yeah, he's still running. And Aaron would have done the same thing versus Alabama. All right, I'm going to skip the 2012 SEC championship game. I mean, you guys would have won the national title. By like four scores. Yeah, Notre yeah. Dame. They, they oh. Alabama killed them. Mm. Yeah, I don't mm. want to bring that up. Thank you. <laughs> it's funny. For all the I played, I played four years, 52 starts. Was it 52? Man, that's a lot. 52 starts. But fans, and like a lot of really good wins, I think. But fans want to talk about 2012. Yeah. <laughs> they want to talk about well, the Auburn game. We're talk about, so close. I know. They want to talk about the Auburn game, senior year, the Hail Mary. So I have to relive those all the time. And then finally, we get to LSU my senior year. Finally. So unfortunately for me, of like all the games I played, uh, and the two of the biggest ones were losses, uh, unfortunate losses. And, um, but that LSU game was pretty sweet in, in 2013. All right, let's talk about Carson Beck for a little bit. Oh, uh, Carson, Carson has, um, you know, I've been talking about a little bit this week on my show and, and just the three things that I've noticed where Carson can clean it up is it looks like he's throwing a lot of balls high yep. right now. And so I'm thinking footwork, he might be, uh, you know, backpedaling a little bit. The ball can sail on you a little bit there. Um, I'm thinking about focusing on getting on top of the ball as far as the release goes up top, yep. being on top. Uh, he's forcing it into some tight windows also. And with the defense doing what they did against Texas, no reason to force it into tight windows mm -mm. Uh, at this point in time the rest of the year. Look, you come off that, you go through your progressions, you check it down. And stay away from that, trying to fit it in there. I know his arm's big. He's got a huge arm. And he can fit it in there a lot. But no reason to do that now. And then the third thing, he's, he's really impressed me with his mobility. Yeah. His ability to pull it down and yeah. run with it. Now, I like how he protects himself because yeah. they're trying to take your head off. Yep. So he's been getting down really nice. So those are the three things that, that stand out to me. What are you thinking? Well, I, I, I mean, listen. He's not played well. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like Carson, to me, you know, I, I've been high on Carson since his freshman year. You know, the moment I saw him in camp uh, in, a, in a spring game, or spring practice or fall scrimmage, whatever it was, like, man, this guy's got it. So I've been excited to see him do his thing. Obviously, he did it last year, and it's just regressed a little bit. But I, I don't want to put it all on the quarterback, and I'm not here just to defend Carson because I'm a quarterback. But there's no one right now in that offense besides ETN who's playing well. Like, tight ends aren't playing well. Receivers aren't balls. playing well. Yeah. I think the offensive line has been underwhelming at times this season. So it's hard to gain confidence as a quarterback when no one around you is playing at a high level. And, and, I, and I go back to a year ago. I thought Carson, what Carson does really well, and I remember I talked to him about this in the offseason, he watched a lot of Aaron Rodgers tape. This was good Aaron Rodgers, not Aaron Rodgers Jets, but good Aaron Rodgers. And, and just how fast... Aaron was able to process the plays and eliminate progressions. So, like, you get up to the line of scrimmage and whatever the play is and say, like, okay, that's not going to work, and let me, let me not waste time going from one to two to three to four. Let me just cut out the fat. One, two ain't going to get open. Let me get the three and four now. And he did such a good job of that. And then everyone was like, well, Carson's not taking shots. Carson's not taking shots. Carson's not taking shots. 
because they're not seeing the whole play because they're only watching a TV copy. They're not seeing the all 22. So I think this year the mentality was, let me take a little bit more shots. Let me be a little bit more risky because that's what people want me to do. But you just don't have the talent on the outside to be able to execute that. Guys are not getting open consistently. So like I said, I think it's a mixture of Carson needs to do what you said, maybe be a little risk avert at times. But also I need to see these receivers win. I need to see these tight ends make some catches. So it's hard to play quarterback when you don't have confidence that your guys are going to win the one-on-one battles or that you guys are even going to catch the football. So as a whole this week, I need to see this offense just get better everywhere. Like I said, right now to me the only playmaker on offense is ATN. Dom has not been what he was two years ago at Missouri. Arians had some big drops this year. Oscar and Lawson have had some big drops. Obviously, Colby's out. Uh, Rara's out. So, I mean, two guys that you worked with all offseason that you thought were going to be in the mix for your starting receivers, they're not playing anymore. And then, you know, Humphreys is a first-year guy in the system. So it's just a, it's, 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 it's hard to play at a high level when, when you have all that uncertainty around you. Yeah, and if Bobo would get his act together. Yeah, and Bobo. And, you, help a little bit. and you're handcuffed by Mike Bobo. I mean, come on now. <laughs> I, I like Lawson Lucky. I do too. Yeah. I'm, I, I, like I said I think he is. He, he's a little bit closer to what Brock was skill set wise, but he's still young. Anthony um, Evans is another one. I like Anthony. Fearless. For some reason, there's something I, I don't know why he's not getting more touches though. So that to me that that they know something that we don't because you see him flash at times and you're like why is it like this coaching staff. Smart enough to know that if this guy's good enough, we'll get him the football. But he's just – something must be a little bit of a disconnect behind the scenes. Yeah, and obviously Carson, one of the top quarterbacks in college football. And uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, at the end of the season, he's all in heading to prep for the NFL draft. How do you see his prospects looking ahead to the next level? Well, I thought preseason he was going to I mean, he walks in the room and he, okay, there's an NFL yes, quarterback, right? 6'5", 225. I'll say two things. One, you know, he was my number one guy heading into the season, NFL draft-wise. He's definitely moved down the list. But, you know, I posted something the other day. I, I ranked the SEC quarterbacks, which I, I had high hopes for SEC quarterbacks this year. You had Jalen, you had Ewers, you had Carson, you had Dart. Nuss, Nussmeyer. Nu, I mean, Nussmeyer, we, you, we haven't really seen, so we didn't know. But you had Dart at Ole Miss, um, the potential of Nico. So all these, all these quarterbacks, and it's really been a disappointing year overall for, for quarterbacks in this league. You know, you know, for a lot of these teams, Jalen, he looks banged up. He's not playing well. I think Dart's playing okay, not great. Nico, obviously, has been very inconsistent. Jalen had one of the worst games I've ever seen him play last week against Tennessee. He hasn't been you know, special for the majority of the year either. So, and obviously, Carson's been very inconsistent. So, like, who is playing well at quarterback right now in college football? Cam, or the, uh, the Cam Ward Cam down Ward at Miami. And uh, Shadur at Colorado. And let's not forget about that Army and Navy quarterback. Yeah. Those quarterbacks there. Yeah. Goodness. So the Lambo. Everybody wants to talk about Carson's Lambo. I, uh, you know, uh, prior to the season, I would just say it spit out the whole name Lamborghini, and they said, "No, no, no." My son's saying, "Dad, everybody calls it the Lambo now." It's just a Lambo. I mean, that NIL, Aaron, you would have cleaned up. I would have cleaned up with that NIL. I, I don't know if I would have got a Lamborghini. What would you have gotten? The Corvette. Just a good old truck. Oh, a good, good old, old truck. truck. That's what I had in college. That's the F one fifty. Um, just kept, I'm not a flashy guy. Yeah, I, tell I, you, I, I like I like I like hanging with my dogs, my kids, my wife, and playing golf. And throwing you know? that back shoulder fade. So you know, maybe would have I would have bought a nice membership to Athens Country Club so oh, I could wow. play golf Ooh, when I was there. That would be nice. That would have been awesome. That would have been fun. This guy's got a nice swing. Let PXGs, you, you would have bought the PXGs. The PXGs went around back then, but, yeah. you know, something nice. Well, I would have gotten a deal, so I would have gotten free clubs. I would have been at the album store. Many many regrets in college. Many regrets on and off the field. Uh, obviously, on the field, which I would have spiked in 2012. Off the field, obviously, we all know Georgia has produced amazing college, you know, collegiate golfers down on the PGA Tour, and a lot of those guys were in school when I was there, like Harris and all those guys. Every year, Hack would be like, Aaron, come play golf with us. Come hang out. Come get lessons. 
I'm like, hack, man. Like, I didn't grow up playing golf. I don't own golf clubs. <laughs> I really could give two shits about playing golf. Yeah. If I could go back and get four years of playing golf with Harris English and hack, I would be able to beat you right you'd now. Be scratched, Instead, I'm struggling man. against you. Yeah, but you'd have to play in way too many scrambles. Yeah, um, I do play in too many scrambles. That's my problem. I played in eight scrambles. That's how summer. I got my start was at Georgia. I didn't really play until I got to college and then would go out to the university practice range and some of the scholarship golfers were there. Help you out a little bit? They said, man, Baloo, your swing stinks. Yep. It doesn't anymore, though. Yeah, they, they helped me out big time. Yeah, I wish. I wish I would have been smart enough to take some lessons from Hack. So the Lambo. Yeah. All right. You tell me he How needs to sell it? How many people have the Lambo in here? <laughs> I don't know. I, from what I hear, he didn't buy the Lambo. He's just... Does it matter, though? They're allowing him to drive the Lambo, and all he's got to do is post some uh, social media content up there a little bit. I think is it, it purple? I think it, is it purple? It's purple? Okay. Um, you know, I'm with you with the truck, though. And one of my favorite hey. stories is about Peyton Manning when he was drafted number one by the Colts. And Peyton Manning showed up the first day in Indianapolis for training camp, and he had a beat-up old truck. He came pulling in uh, smoking, they said, out of the tailpipe. The thing's... 1965 Ford F-150, I think Cousins, it was. Kirk Cousins had the, uh, the Love Mobile, the van, for, for a lot of his beginning of his career. <laughs> uh, they asked Peyton Manning, what do you plan to do with all that money you're going to make? And I love what Peyton said. He said, I plan to earn the money. Uh, That's what I plan to do with it. There we go. There we go. It's a lot of money these guys are making nowadays. The whole, the whole NIL portal is... It's a mess. You're right in the middle of this. I am in the middle You're of it. You're the co-CEO, Aaron Murray, the co-CEO of the Players' Lounge. Yeah. You're right in the middle of it. Yes. The the NIL portion of it, I'm fine with. Like, players getting paid, I love it. Like, these guys deserve it. They bring a lot of money, 100%. The portal magnifies those issues because these guys have the, the ability to essentially be a free agent whenever they want. Um, you know, like... I would have never thought, I mean, we talked about this the other day on, on my show with, like, No Sean and those guys. Like, when we committed to Georgia, we had to make it work. Unless you want to go to a JUCO for a year or sit out or go out of the SEC, you had to make it work. You had to wake up early, watch more film, get in the weight room. What, you had to become better. That Plain and simple. Become better or go to a JUCO. Now these guys are like, you know what? Like, do I really want to become better? Because... If I'm just not good enough, then I'll just go somewhere else. Like, there is not that drive. There's not that love. There's not that, you know, I'm dedicated to X university. So, like, the, the, the NIL is not the problem. The NIL needs to get cleaned up, no doubt about it. The collective is the problem. The collective is the problem. Um, the, the here's a hat, let me go to our biggest donors and everyone donate money like it's a GoFundMe, that's a problem. It needs to be NIL, name, image, and likeness. If, if Lamborghini wants to do a deal with me, okay, that's, that's great. Not, because I just think the, the collective model is, is unsustainable. It's not sustainable. You can't just keep going back to the same people year after year and saying donate money. Oh, and by the way, I need money for the university too so we can continue to build facilities and do this, that, and the other. So, um, but the portal needs to get cleaned up. These guys need to have some sort of accountability to, I've committed to this university. I have to stay X amount of years and I got to figure out a way to make this happen. Tell us about the uh, the two years you you spent in Kansas City with the Chiefs. Uh, I remember I got the call from I was at home in Tampa. And I looked down the phone. I see Kansas City, Missouri, and like so like my agent Pat Dye Jr. We went through like all the teams that I met with that we thought would draft me in Kansas City. I met with Matt Nagy. That he was the quarterback coach at the time. The night before Pro Day, I met with him. So that was the only interaction I had with Kansas City. Him and I sat down and watched some tapes. Like, didn't really think that, that, that you know, I would get a call from them. And I remember getting the call, and I was like, the first thing in my mind, honestly, was not, like, happiness. It was, like, what is in Kansas City, Missouri? Like, where am I going? Because, like, you think, like, you know, New York or Dallas or Miami. You can or get a big stake in Atlanta. Kansas City. 
I was like, I've never been to the Midwest ever in my life. I'm literally like going my mind like, what, who is calling me from Kansas City, Missouri? I was like, oh yeah, the Chiefs. Oh yeah, there's an NFL team in Kansas City. And uh, I remember when I landed, I was like, my goodness, there's actually a city here. Like they actually have tall buildings. Like this is legit. Like I'm not going to the middle of cow pastures. And um, I loved it. The people were amazing. For the people, for, for those who have never been to Arrowhead, it is the, the best atmosphere in all the NFL. I mean, it feels like a college atmosphere. The fans are passionate. They're just great people. It's a great town to live in. Very family friendly. Nice golf courses. Um, great food. Barbecue is amazing. Um, the off season was a little rough. It gets a little cold. It's a little, 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 little nasty. But other than that, man, I loved all two years. I'm very fortunate. I mean, I'm, my quarterback room was Andy Reid, Matt Nagy, um, Dougie Fresh, who's now the head coach for, for, for Jacksonville, who won, won the first Super Bowl of Philadelphia, uh, Alex Smith, Chase Daniel, who is the greatest backup in NFL history. So, like, our meetings, the stories that were told, the knowledge that was in that room, I mean, I learned so much. That I thought you always think, like, you walk in, like, this rookie that owns all the SEC records. Like, I know, I know everything about football. And then you sit down with a meeting with Andy Reid and those guys. And, and I truly thought my first, my first quarterback meeting, I thought they were messing with me. They were saying things about football that, that were like me speaking in Mandarin to you. It made no sense to me. I was a different – I literally thought they were messing with me. And then they gave me the playbook, and I opened it up. I'm like, oh, my God. It's, it's, it is the jump of what football is and what you think football – what you know about football from college to NFL is, is a whole nother world. Um, but it, I learned a lot, man. It was fun every single day. Andy Reid would walk in with a napkin – because he would sleep in his office, wake up, jot some notes down, jot a play down. <laughs> and he would literally, in the morning, because we'd get there like 5.36 to watch film. He'd come in there 5.36, throw down like four or five napkins with plays on it. And be like, Alex, what do you think about these plays? I mean, would sleep and dream about football. Wake up, would take notes, and then that would be some of the plays we would install that week. It was, um, I, it was, it was an incredible two years. We, I think we're going to take some questions uh, from the audience, so to speak. And so don't be, uh, don't be shy. Don't be bashful. Okay, go ahead. What the? Oh, Key's got the mic for you. What is your, uh, what's your index in golf and what clubs do you play with? Irons. So I am 9.1. 9 uh, I'm very fortunate. One of my buddies is the... Uh, CFO of Avira Mira. It's a, like a Japanese iron. A few guys on the tour play them, but got some free clubs. Yes, yeah, play some Miras. Yes, Titleist Driver, Miras, Callaway, Hybrid, and Three Wood. I'm playing a 17 now. and uh, No, he's sandbagging uh, then. <laughs> and playing the, if you're playing, playing the Mizunos. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to get some Mizunos. Soon. All right, Mike, we got another. Here we go. Aaron, you talked about. Um, kind of the wide receivers what about the linemen like what were some guys you played with that were just monsters that really impressed you physically uh freshman year we had a really good offensive line like massive like cordy glenn who played in the nfl for a while uh ben jones is uh, he is what a center should be I, I was lucky enough i had four years with two amazing centers uh, ben and then david andrews i mean both long nfl careers david obviously still with the new england patriots but the stories I had about Ben Jones, I mean, one of the nasty like, – he is what you want at center because he's just nasty. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this story, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll restate it. You know, in that Auburn game where I fractured my sternum, I'm obviously struggling to, like, call a play. Like, I could barely talk. And I remember Ben being who Ben is, ripped the middle linebacker's dreads out, like ripped them out. And I'm in the huddle, and Ben's like, hey, Murray, I got some dreads for you. <laughs> I got I got him back. I'm like I'm like I'm looking up there's 25 seconds on the play clock. I can barely breathe. We're on the road. It's like we're actually winning at this point. I'm like, "Ben, what do you want me to do with those, bro? Like, what do you want me to do?" So he sticks them in his pants. Keeps them in his pants. And then like after him like, "Ben, it wasn't the middle linebacker who got me. It was the defensive tackle." So like if anything like it hurt him. Like the middle linebacker was actually a nice guy. Like that wasn't nice of you. 
So Ben goes home that night and ties him to a ceiling fan. So like you have like dreadlocks where you have to like pull to turn the fan on. I'm like, I'm like Ben, you're disgusting. But like he would walk the field barefoot before every game. You could like dare him to eat anything. He would eat it like rodents, whatever, critters. He would do it. Um, he was just like one of those like super nasty has your back. I remember one day in practice too. He obviously we do two minute drives like once or twice a week. And the defense would always get ticked off because Rick would never blow the whistle. So like a defense tackle would like run by you and tap you and I would complete it for 30 yards and Rick would be like, move the chains, move the chains. And they're like, we sacked him, we sacked him. So one day Cornelius Washington, who's a monster, comes off the edge and decks me. I'm in practice, which you know, like don't, you can't hit a quarterback in practice. And Ben Jones, little fat self, Chase Cornelius, who runs like a 4-4, chased him around the field for 20 minutes. I mean, just chased him. Like, don't you touch my quarterback. So that's another story. Third great Ben, ben Jones story. If you threw interceptions, Bobo would make you roll, which was a stupid punishment. I hated rolling. So you would literally get on the ground and just roll laps. And I remember I had a couple picks, so I had to roll a lot of laps. And I got to the point where I, like, essentially blacked out. I can't see. I'm dizzy. I'm throwing up. And Ben would, Ben came over because he was rolling too. He finished. He loved rolling. That's just how, that tells you how psycho he is. Ben loved to roll. Like I'm over here dying and he's like loving it. Ben started rolling me, like pushing me. So like I just laid there. I'm dead. Not, I'm unable to move. I got like 30 yards to go. And Ben would just grab me and just start rolling me. He just rolled me. Um, so that's just the human being he is, as I'm, like, puking everywhere. Uh, so you never great. introduced him to your sister, did you? Well, that was another funny, too. Yeah. So I remember when I was getting recruited, my sister was a hell of an athlete, an incredible athlete. Her and I are, were at the Mark Rick camp, and her and I are throwing the ball back and forth. Like, my sister could throw the ball, not like the, like an NFL college ball, they're a little big. I mean, she actually was something. She could throw a collegiate football probably 40, 45 yards, like launch it. So her big thing was – Flag football in Florida is a sanctioned sport for, for girls. Um, she threw like 40 plus touchdowns and like 70% completion her first year. She was whipping it. So she's like, I broke your state record for completion percentage. So she always reminds me that. That's why she was so hard on me when I threw picks because she was better than I was. Did you ever ask her if she saw that linebacker? No, oh, she never man. threw picks. But anyway, so her and I are throwing the ball at the, at the camp after the game, after the camp. And Ben was a freshman. And uh, Ben went to my dad, and he was like, damn, Aaron's girlfriend's hot, and she can throw a football. <laughs> my dad's like, uh, that's his sister. That's my daughter. <laughs> it's like, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. That's good stuff. So I love, I love both of them. I mean, David, I got a million stories about David, yeah. Ben. Um, great, great, great dudes. Yeah. Quarterbacks love their centers. Yes. Well, we get very intimate, um, obviously. Well, yeah, you got to put your hands <laughs> all up your in hand their right sweaty there. butt. As Rick said, find the duty hole. You know, that was always saying. Oh, wow. Find the duty hole. <laughs> Goodness. That's not my words. That's Coach Rick's yeah. words. Yep. Key, we got the mic out? Oh. So on NIL a little bit, how, how do you think it can get fixed, and do you think it's going to get to a point where either state or – national lawmakers will get involved well i think they are to fix it so so we had our so as i work for espn yes sec networks are kind of underneath that uh are, are covered under that umbrella but anyways we had our seminar up in bristol and and the president president baker of the ncaa came and spoke to us and obviously they want to push forward you know it'll see like how fast any of this happens they're hoping early next year but i mean the goal would be to have some sort of revenue share with the players where you know, I think the number is around twenty twenty one million dollars. About sixteen of that million would go to the football team, and and I think that would solve a lot of issues. You know, I was at Ole Miss about a month ago. I had one of their games, and I actually sat down with their. They have a GM. A lot of these teams, not not a lot, but there's there's a lot of these teams that are going to get GMs, and I sat down with him for about thirty forty five minutes, just talking about how his role and how it's needed, and you know, he's gone around to a lot of NFL teams and figure out like how do they structure their salary cap. How do they allocate money to certain position groups? So, like, they already know, like, when this is passed, we know how much our starting quarterback is going to get, our backup quarterback, our offensive line, our defensive backs, all these guys. Like, we're ready to go. So I think that will clean up a lot of it. 
Um, and that's what I'm hoping for. Like these these kids deserve to get paid. They deserve a piece of the of, of the pie from from college football. So I think if you 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 share in that revenue, that will and also as we've talked about eliminate some of these collectives where it's it's the collectives can be in charge of being a a marketing arm so where they can bring in marketing deals but they're not a gofundme like i just hate this gofundme model where like the texas of the worlds are gonna dominate because they got all this money man like it's just it, it, it should not be who's got the biggest bag is gonna win championships you know it should be able who can develop talent who can retain talent and 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 recruit at a high level because of who their coaches are and their tradition not oh i'm going to go to x school because they're going to pay me from their collective eight million dollars over four years so i think that will solve it when 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 you have a salary cap i think that's going to ease a lot of the problems and i'm and i'm hoping that's you know as soon as possibly next football season Um, in terms of your broadcasting and getting ready for games, what does that look like in terms of the preparation and, and how you get ready for uh, Saturday and, and to be able to call a game? A lot of film, which is why I love it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a film nerd. I love watching tape, breaking it down. So I, I usually watch two or three games of each team, offense, defense, take my notes. Um, we have a lot of really good resources back even when I was at CBS and now at ESPN. So like, we get inundated with emails of just like, a ton of articles stories so it's a lot of reading it's a lot of watching tape um you know we'll get probably about an hour and a half to two hours with each team to meet with coaches players so then you have an opportunity to like sit down and ask questions um but a lot of it's just staying on top of it so i cover college football 24 7 365 all year long so i i'm, I'm pretty up to date with all the storylines the teams um i watch pretty much every sec game every week um like, that's my Sunday night, Monday. It's just, like, going and watching the, all the SEC games. But I get the coaches' tape. So I get to watch, like, high end zone, all 22. So, like, I'll watch a game in, like, 45 minutes. So I'm able to, like, kind of knock them all out um, pretty good between Sunday night and, and Monday morning. So, like, I, I know the teams really well. So, like, like, last week I had Florida, Kentucky. This week I have Arkansas, Mississippi State. I've watched every Arkansas, State, Arkansas game. I've watched every Mississippi State game. So like I know the players, I know the schemes. So now that I have the game, I just watch it a little bit more. I'll go back and rewatch it, pay a little bit more attention to certain, you know, mostly like third downs, red zones, um, end of half, you know, end of games, like situational stuff, and um, and then from there, just like I said, keep 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 reading the articles. Yeah, I've got my wife will uh, see me watching like a, a game for the second time, and she'll say, well, "Didn't you watch that the first time?" <laughs> Don't get the right it's angles. a quarterback thing, yeah. all right? You got to look at all uh, 22 well, players out there. Well, yeah, and, and I think, and this goes back to, you know, always focusing on the quarterback. As a fan, even as a commentator, when you're calling the game, you're told you have to follow the ball because that's what people are watching. Yeah. People are trained to watch the football, and as they should. Like, that's see ball, get ball, go go follow it. Um, whereas a quarterback, you and I have always been taught to to watch safeties, watch alignment, watch – where certain guys give certain tales. And a lot of times you don't get that when you watch a game on the normal broadcast because all they care about is giving the fan what they want, and that's watching the football. So like me watching Georgia, Texas on the couch, I don't get the information I need to then go, go be able to talk about it properly. I need to be able to see the all 22, right. the high ends and all that stuff. Yeah, watch it as a uh, – I enjoy watching it as a fan. I don't. The first time. I and then go back and watch uh, the video later and look and see what the guard's doing, looking yes. and seeing what the center's doing. See, like, when, 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 when they have the multiple angles, like for national championship, they have, like, ten different broadcasts. I watch, like, by myself. Because I, I don't like watching games with other people. Like, my, my brother and dad are, like, screaming, cussing, yelling. Uh, and I'm just, like, sitting there watching it. And, like, I don't say a lot. And I was like, why aren't you, like... I'm like I'm just like trying like I'm I'm, I'm trying to analyze it like I'm always analyzing it. just like the way I'm wired, um, but I always watch the the whatever the cam that's over the head yeah whatever that is that that's from the quarterback perspective, you don't get audio from it, but that's like when I get the option yeah. to watch that that's the game I'm watching if they have a channel for that one. How do you think Tom Brady's doing? 
I don't watch NFL. Okay. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen Tom do it. I know his rocky start. I've heard, but yeah, he's he's trying to settle in. Yeah, it's not easy. High expectations for Tom. My first game I called broadcasting. I wrote out my open. It's a UCF game, so of course UCF fans love to even rib me more. <laughs> I wrote out my open. I prepped, prepared for it all day long, memorized it, which is stupid. I've never memorized a thing in my life since then. You rookie. Rookie mistake. So I get on there, got a little lump in the throat, obviously, and I start talking. And I mess up, I mess up like in the second or third word, and it goes to gibberish. Like literally, I'm speaking gibberish. And I remember looking at my phone afterwards, and my mom texts me, she goes, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, I'm like, it was so bad that even my mom texted me and said, I'm so sorry. And your sister said? Luckily, not many people were watching that game. Now my sister probably texts me like, you should find a new career. <laughs> or it's only up for here. Uh, but I learned from that moment, do not, do not write out your open because as yeah. soon as you mess up one word, it is um, I usually even don't think about the open until I get there. I'm usually like an hour before the game. Dave, I work with Dave Neal who lives in Atlanta. You've worked with his dad. And Dave, like 30 minutes before, he's like, so my, my first question is going to be this. I'm like, okay, sounds good. Like one practice round, you know, we go through it one time with the producer where we, we, we hit it. And as long as the timing's good, just go do it. And the funny thing is I usually don't say what I say in the practice round when the broadcast actually happens because I don't want to memorize what I'm going to say. So. Mike Key, we got anybody else? Uh, anybody? 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 I do have one real quick, Kate, gentlemen. Do you have one? Uh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, two uh, Georgia alums, uh, and having been uh, since I was knee high to a grasshopper, my grandfather's taking me. Is there one tradition at Georgia that you really look back at, and either week in or week out, maybe the dog walk, maybe it's uh, maybe it's something that took place behind the scenes, or any one thing uh, that you remember and that you miss about being uh, at the University of Georgia? Uh, I love the dog walk. Love the dog walk. I mean, that was always a special time, getting off the bus. I didn't love everything that led up to the dog walk because we would stay we would stay at Lake Lanier. So we would drive an hour and a half, stay at Lake Lanier, then get back in the bus the next day, drive the facility, get ready, then get back on the bus, and then go to Sanford. And you're like, oh, my God, I feel like I've had a full day already. And we haven't even got to warm-ups yet. Um, so I love the way they do it now where they stay on campus, which is obviously a lot smarter. And they have nice locker rooms where they can get ready at the stadium. And not, you know, have this room that was – our locker room in the stadium when I played was probably about just twice the size of this, no lockers, and fold-up chairs. That was, that was our locker room in the stadium. They've so a, a little bit of an upgrade. Way. But, no, like the, uh, the dog walk is unbelievably special. Um, and I will still, to this day, cry every time I hear Bobo O'Reilly in Sanford Stadium. Like, I don't know what it is. Like, hearing that song – before kickoff, like I would get so emotional. Like, cause I think it, what song? Bob O'Reilly. Okay, I thought it was Bill O'Reilly. No, it's Bob O'Reilly. Oh, okay. Yeah, Bob O'Reilly. Am I right? Bob O'Reilly. Yeah. yeah, it's Bob O'Reilly. You know, I don't, I don't know what a. I never really figured it out, but I used to tear up uh, when the lone trumpeteer in the upper deck yeah. would play. Uh, just really. I guess you knew it was time to. It's time. To, well, they, I think that was, was like go time. It was that into Baba, yeah. so like that was like it's go time, and you're like, okay, yeah. this is. But even if I go as a fan now, as soon as the song starts playing, my parents will look at me like waiting for me to start crying. They're like, <laughs> it's coming, it's coming. I'm like, I have to like distract myself and like go like talk to someone so I don't hear it. But I don't know, man. It's just good times in that stadium. I mean, it's a unbelievable place to play football. We're you know both in our. Buck and I are very fortunate to play there for, for as long as we played, and um, it's just it's a beautiful place, man. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I think is there is anybody else? Any other questions? No more? That's it. A big round of applause for Buck and Aaron this morning. So